questions or whatever. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we're going live, man. There we go. All right, so there you go. All right, cool. All right, we, uh, we are live. All right, welcome, YouTube. Um, let me record this. All right, cool. All right, good. We're now recording Amar, so we are live. But let me just uh, see if I can see it on my feed here. Hold on just a second. All right. So what we're going to talk about, my friends, Amar and I have uh, – uh, Amar showed me this article from uh, – um Forbes, right? Amar? Yeah, about Forbes. The, about the, the mega Roth. It wasn't like a I don't know if you call it a backdoor Roth. I'm not sure, but it was no. it was actually pretty interesting. So we want to talk about that. And then I had a, a guy send me an article from a market watch about what you need to retire in various states, which I uh which I chuckled at. So Mar, if you want to bring that up, I'm trying to get uh there we go. All right, cool. We got uh let me just turn that down. All right, cool. There we go. I got the live chat up. All right, sweet. Uh, and of course, if you all have any questions, by all means, let us know. We're going to do this on a regular basis for sure. And uh, as we go forward, uh, if you have articles you want us to talk on or anything you want us to talk about in advance, let us know so we can prepare for it. So what's going on with you today there, big man? What's going on in the great state of California? Yeah, yeah I mean... Uh... This time change. I used to oh. love the time change daylight savings. Now I hate it. <laughs> my my. So I, I have two kids, right? Two and four, and they just can't get on the right sleep schedule. So oh. lately, they've been going to bed at seven o'clock and waking up at like five. <laughs> uh, so it's not good. What about you? How's Pablo doing with the time change? <laughs> oh my goodness, he uh, was up. Uh... He does this thing called the Harlem shake. That's what I call it, where he just, he'll get up out of his Pablo bed and he'll shake. And I'm always like, whoa, what? Cause I wake up like that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. Let's go for a walk. Let's go outside. I'm like, you know, like freaking walking like Scooby-Doo through a, a castle or something or shaggy. <laughs> I take him outside and you know he'll pee or something like that. And then, uh, it's, which is fine. But yeah. uh, man, I had to do that for not once, not twice, not thrice, but whatever four is. Last night it was, and there he is. And I was just snoozing away. I said, "Man, the life of a dog, man. He's uh, you know, just sitting there snoozing." And yet, uh, and I've already given him two walks already since I've been up uh, this morning. But uh, he's he's a nut, man. He is a nut. <laughs> he's wiring me out for sure. Yeah. But, um, no, it's all good. It's beautiful here in Georgia. A freaking emerald blue sky, or a uh, uh, what's the color I'm looking for? A blue sky. But uh, it's just it's freaking gorgeous, dude. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, I can bet. So you want me to put the article yeah. up or do you, you want to do talking points first or how, oh, how yeah, we, we got, this? uh, so here's uh, the article Colette says, Hey, from Michigan, Blue, uh, my man, Rob, beautiful with the mass. Rob was not on my live stream the other day. And I told him, I said that the Patriots were going to lose. And of course I was right. Uh, Denise from Southern California, Amar, Denise is on yeah, board from SoCal. What part of Southern Cal are you for? Are you from Denise? Uh, Sharon, right on. Uh, life insurance and retirement, maybe instead of uh, <laughs> instead of long term care, uh, we could talk about that. Um, yeah. Are you uh, Amar? Are you licensed to sell life insurance by chance or no? Yeah, I'm licensed. Yeah. Okay, and not saying I, I'm just curious. Like, so you have access to the the, the various products? That I don't, but that are out there and whatnot. Yeah. So we use a, a third party broker that will shop around. Okay. You know, they have like 50 different carriers that they can shop with. Okay. So I'm not doing the actual underwriting. We just broker it out to a third party vendor, third party broker that shops around for our end client. Gotcha. Yeah. It looks like so I'm, I'm going to make a list. So I'm taking notes here, Josh. So, so okay. we'll find an article about life insurance versus long-term care. Was that, is that what that was? Yep. I'm trying to make it so it, uh, Shows us both. It looks like it's just showing you or me for some reason. It's weird, but all right, whatever. Um, it's strange. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Okay. All right, either way. Um, then we got uh, uh, someone from Washington State, Mushki. Uh, I want to invest in Vanguard ETFs in a taxable account, but recently said someone on Fox say there are problems with these things. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So, uh, what what are what we can dive on that here today, uh, Mushki? Um, 
we can talk a little bit too, Sharon, about life insurance as opposed to long-term care. I got no qualm talking about that, uh, but just be kind of uh, off the top. And and you know, and Amar has access to the products that are out there. I'm familiar with the products, but they do change quite a bit. Uh, Amar, just real quick before I jump on this, any thoughts on uh, on Vanguard ETFs and a and a taxable account? What would there? I don't know what the problems would be. Any thoughts on why there would be problems with Vanguard ETFs and a taxable account? No, not off the top of my head. Maybe there's an article that the that individual is talking about that could send over, and we can just skim it real quick. Um, uh, she says she saw someone on Fox. I wonder. I wonder if she. Uh, if if I have you read it all or heard anything about it? We I think we talked about this uh, about ET uh, index funds getting too big. I wonder if that's what she's talking about. The ETS or index funds are getting too big. I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, there's. Um... Hey, Daniel. There's a, I guess there was a, who's the guy that did the big short? Um, not Michael Lewis. Yeah. But yeah. Burry, Michael Burry. Burry, Burry yeah. yeah. And Burry was, wrote an article that, that got published that these index funds are getting too big. Yeah. And that there's a bubble in index funds. Um, and and I, I don't believe that personally. Um, you know, if we look at market capitalization of index funds, versus uh, actively managed funds, you also have to take into account institutional money. Yeah. And institutional money is uh, a lion's share of the funds that are out there. And when you look at board seats, I think one of the, the it, and this is off the top of my head, uh, I haven't prepared for this, but one of the things that they talked about in that article was that um, when you get something like Vanguard that owns such a large percentage of a company, uh, and eventually that they get board seats, how are they going to vote? Yes. Right. Yep. And, and uh, because if they are taking an active role in voting, then it's no longer passive, right? It's, you know, they're, they're making decisions for the company. And, and that's what she's, that's what she's referencing, referencing the guy or lady on Fox says index yeah. funds are getting too big. Yeah, they're not getting too big. I mean, I did a video on this the other day where I just said, look, uh, index funds are at least the S and P 500 is a market weighted fund. And so yeah. you're buying more and more of your investments are going into the largest uh, stocks and in, in, uh, by market capitalization in the country. Yeah. And so if you want to avoid that, you just buy an equal weighted indexes. <laughs> I, yeah. Mushki, I, people are looking for something to write about. There's no other way around that. The yeah. idea that by that index funds are so big um, that there's going to be what, what blur Burry was talking about is that there's no more pricing mechanisms, what he's saying, which is inherently stupid. I, I just, I, I, what, there's always a pricing mechanism. If you have a buy and a sell side, if you have a buy and a sell side, uh, there's a pricing mechanism. It, it doesn't make any sense. So I was. Yeah, uh, and, and um, the one thing that I would say, the one thing I would say is that when we look at, uh, the investment universe. So yeah. you have two extremes, right? You can be 100% passive, 100% active, right? Both of those extremes need each other in order to have appropriate pricing, right? So if everybody, for example, was 100% index funds, then you don't have accurate pricing on securities and you can make an arbitrage, right? Exactly. That's what, and that's what the active managers are saying, right? Exactly. Or Burry, Burry's saying. <laughs> But if everybody was active, right. then pricing is very clear. And, and when pricing is very clear, you could be a passive investor and do just as well. I think what the, the key thing to look at here is that if you're in a high volume or high traded market, pricing is going to be inherently pretty accurate. Exactly. I, so, 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 so to say that there's this huge bubble, uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree. Well, personally. if anything, if I'm Michael... Burry, wherever his name is, I'm loving it because then I can go against the, you know, if the if the herd's going one direction, I think the herd is wrong, then then the pricing mechanism absolutely work in my way. I it's uh it's an odd, it's an odd concern to have for sure. I just I kind of chuck, but there's a lot of people uh because everyone needs something to be fearful of. That's that's all there is to it, Mar. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So we got a couple other folks join us. We got uh Starling. Jeff and uh, CG Polly and Denise uh, is coming from the South Bay, if you know where that is, LA County. So yep. is that your LA neck County? Place? Yeah, well, she's probably pretty close to the 405 fires, the um, Getty fires there. 
Is that because uh, the, your environmental insanity, they won't let them <laughs> clear cut the, uh, the power lines? Um, and to make you feel good about yourself, Amar, uh, Mushki says, thank you both for being rational, logical, and with no hype. Um, I, I, I would attribute that to me. Amar is nothing but irrationality. <laughs> <laughs> the That's engineer in the room. room. <laughs> <laughs> so let's so, talk so Josh, let's, let, let's go yeah. through this article Absolutely. real quick. I think maybe what we do is go through this article and um, this other article from uh, Yeah, no, Starling. Starling, Starling says yeah. This. yeah, right on. And then, so let's look uh, at the, uh, the mega rod. I thought this was interesting, Amar. Yeah, there yeah. you go. So, so we all heard of the backdoor Roth IRA in the sense that you can put money into uh, a non-deductible IRA and convert it to a Roth IRA and, uh, and pay no taxes. Now, that is, you got to make sure that you have no other IRAs when you're doing that because the, the tax calculation is a, a percentage of what's deductible over total IRAs. So, so that is important. Well, what this article is talking about is using your existing qualified plan. So if you have a 401k that has a pre-tax option and a Roth 401k option, you can use that and put the max in, which is 19,000, right? And if you're over 50, there's extra 6,000 that you can put in. So you can max that up to 25. So if you have a TSP, this works for you as well, right? Uh, 401a... 457. I'm just trying to think 403B. 403B, 403B yeah. as well. Yeah. So all, all those qualified plans. And traditionally, you could only put, uh, you know, 6,000 or 7,000 if you're 50 or older into a Roth IRA. So part of this is saying, how do we create this, what Forbes calls is a mega Roth right here? And how the new Secure Act will pretty much cement this. So, um, and I'm just skipping around here. So I want to go to, they, they have an example. Yeah, they should will, I think. It. Yeah, the, It's right here. So um, let's say the overall limit is 56,000 in a 401k or 62,000 if you're over 50, right? And it's right here. And so what, what they're saying here is that, you know, at first glance, you can put the full 19,000 into a Roth IRA and you get some matching, and and you, most people would say that they're done. But if you're an empty nester, if you're like in the last three or five years of retirement and you want to put away a lot more money, this could be uh, potentially a good thing in the sense that you can put the difference in this in the after-tax bucket. And so they give an example here of Willard, who's 50, maxes out at 25000 his company gives him a 5% match. And so that's an additional 7,500. So if you add these two numbers up, right, and you subtract it from the IRS, the RISA maximum, which is 62 because he's 50 or older, you get that he can still add to his retirement plan an additional 29,500 in that after tax bucket. And what this article is saying is that with the SECURE Act, they're basically going to put it in writing that any after-tax money can be, when you retire, can be put into the Roth IRA. And so one of the things here is that even now is after-tax bucket can go into the Roth IRA. Right, Josh? Yeah. Well, what they're selling, if you scroll up a little bit, I guess you got it. Um, it'll show you that there's literally a rule right there. Revenue notice 2014-54 that states explicitly that after-tax contributions uh, to be rolled uh, exactly to a Roth, which is yeah. which is pretty interesting to me. Um, so I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I, I I mean I was kind of aware somewhat. I haven't really thought too much about it, but that would say, look, man, if you got the cash flow and you put after-tax contributions, contributions, not your gain, not your um. Just, just the contributions can go into the Roth, which uh, they show you the example down there where this guy's putting like two hundred fifty-eight thousand or something like that. Uh, keeps scrolling down, uh, two ninety-five. So he goes, he could roll his after-tax contributions of two ninety-five into his Roth IRA, and then the rest of his uh, pre-tax earnings off those contributions would go into his regular IRA. Yeah, if the plan allowed. If the plan allowed. So, so this is something that. Um... I think people should check with their employer, like the HR team, if they can do this. 
right? Number one. Oh, yeah. Because they're going to know your plan better than anybody else. And then the second thing is if the SECURE Act goes through, I mean, yeah. this is almost now written into the to the code, right? So uh, I think a lot of people would take advantage of this. And when we look at retirement savings, you want to be able to pull from different buckets from a tax perspective, right? So we, we've always talked about you want to make sure you have enough liquidity. Yeah. You also want to make sure that when you're withdrawing funds, that you're taking them from different buckets to give you the best tax situation. And maybe what I'll do is, um, do you want me to draw an example here? Uh, yeah, but I want to, cause I do want to show something here. Uh, we'll go down right where you highlighted one uh, sentence underneath that Willard, Willard uh, can do an in-service withdrawal to the Roth. He could, so at 59 and a half, he could do an in-service withdrawal from the Roth. And it, 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 the guy who wrote this article, we'll put the link in the show notes. He made it seem as if this is by IRS dictate. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, do you know, mm -hmm. like he made it sound like once you hit 59 and a half, uh, Amar, that in-service distributions, in-service withdrawals are automatic. Do you know that to be true? I, I didn't, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. So I think it's planned. I believe it's plan dependent Me too. That's once, what I once you're too. 55 yeah. or older, right. It's, it's written into the plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the other things with in-service distributions or doing a 72 T distribution um, could be part of this as well. So you can stretch out this tax-free income for, you know, like an annuity payment for a long period of time. If well, especially of the SECURE Act. And that's so the yeah. issue that we have here is the SECURE Act, um, as we've talked about before, and I think even you and I, maybe even our first time we did this, Amar, we talked about SECURE Act, is that it's going to eliminate your heirs' ability to stretch. The stretch IRA is gone. That's just all there is to it. So everyone talked about the stretch IRA. Once the SECURE Act is signed, sealed, and delivered, that, that that's gone. And if you're leaving $500,000 pre-tax you know, to Amar, and Amar is making a million bucks a year, uh, he's going to get hammered because he'll have 10 years in which to just make those distributions out. Uh, to, and, to, and keep in mind the tax rate is the next dollar, right? Yeah, so like yeah. if you're, if your beneficiaries are earning um, in the 22% tax bracket, for example, it's the next dollar that they get taxed on. Right. So it's not like a blended rate of what you have yeah. or like the long-term capital gains exactly. rate. It, exactly. it, it, that rate can go up. Now, one of the things, so this is good for if you're a 1099 employee, an independent contractor, if you're self-employed, um, you know, maybe a realtor, you had a good couple of years or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Because uh, I think realtors are self-employed. And I, I yeah, see so, so if they have a solo 401k, exactly, right? Exactly. In a solo 401k, you can have a pre-tax bucket, a, a Roth bucket, and then a Roth 401k bucket, and an after-tax bucket. Yeah. Right. So Absolutely. it all depends on your plan documents. It's, it's really important to, to kind of look at that. And one thing Josh and I didn't forgot to mention in the beginning is this is purely educational. We we're just reading articles oh. and reviewing it. Um, I'm licensed. So I, I have to say that I'm not getting oh, advice oh, yeah, sure, and, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, yeah. so the issue is though, if you have, let's say you're 55 years old, you're a realtor and you're making bank, uh, and you're going to do it for five more years. And you're like, man, I, you know, I, 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 my goal would be to retire at 60, uh, pull my money from my IRAs out while I'm deferring Social Security. And I'd like to leave more and more of Roth IRAs and Social Security so I can take tax free income later on down the road. Um, you're willing to pay a little bit more tax today while the Trump tax bills are in effect. And maybe you're married filing jointly and maybe even still have some, uh, you know, write offs. I, I don't know. But anyway, you say I'm going to write I'm going to I'm going to pay a little bit more tax today in order to have the big benefits later on down the road. Uh, and if you're self-employed, uh, this could be something good for you, because remember, the 401k, a 403b, you know, these are all somewhat synonymous. But with the 401k, you have three funding sources. You got your contributions your employer contributions, and then profit sharing. So if you are the employer and the employee, like this guy was saying, Amar, I think he said 62000 or something like that. And that's a lot of flipping money that can go into one of these accounts. I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you do that for a couple of years, man, you are, you're sitting nicely. Yeah. And, it's, and, the, and the other thing to, to keep in account, like if you're self-employed and you have high income, you'll probably want to maximize your QBI deduction, right? So you could even do the pre-tax part of the 19 or the 25,000 
and then do the after tax contributions as well. So that way you're hitting, you're still getting the QBI if you're, if you're in that situation. Uh, that's where we just got to talk to a tax person on that. That's yeah. a, an area that I'm absolutely not an expert by stretch, even though I did get QBI last year, Mar. I got a QBI deduction, if you can believe that. That's yeah. pretty sweet. That, you know, that's a, that was, uh, I think I got 5,000 bucks, which is a credit against my taxable income. Um, I'm just looking at comments. Uh, one thing I didn't like about this guy, and I emailed him more before we got on here, is he, he was talking about highly compensated employees. And uh, I, I don't know that to be true here. So it, the, the, we're not going to dive into this. But when you're talking about this stuff with 401k plans, if you're an employee, um, it makes it somewhat restricted because if there is something called highly comp HCEs and, and you can't have a top heavy, which means the wealthier employees get more benefit than the you know, average riffraff. Uh, so because of that, if it's top heavy, the IRS frowns on it and will, will make you make it not so top heavy. This guy was stating a couple of things that I, I don't know this to be true, actually. Um, and I, I don't want to get too deep into it. But the whole point is, if you are looking at this and you are an employer, i.e. you own your own firm or you have a, you're responsible for your own firm's uh, retirement plan, you definitely need competent advice on this stuff. And, and frankly, I, I, there isn't that many competent advisors when it comes to these uh, because they just, they're few and far between. And just because a CPA has a CPA after his name or a CFP has a CFP after his name, that's not, do you do this stuff, Amar? I mean, do you go into 401k plans, solo Ks and all that? Do you, do you, yeah. Uh, okay. so, so we don't sell solo 401ks or anything like that. Um, you know, you have to have a defined contribution license to, to be in that uh, world. But we do do strategies. I mean, um, but you, you're not sponsored. You're not like you don't manage a 401k or anything like that. No, no, okay. not right now. No. I used to I used to do that when I was a broker and uh, we had everything through American funds and I had a lot of not a lot but four or five dental shops uh, and that was good it was it was it was hard though because you're talking to the dentists who have the money uh, the dental hygienists make real good money and everybody else they had I mean it was I, I enjoyed it immensely but it's it's a uh, if you're going into my friends to a company that has a lot of plans under their belt. And and they're offering individual guidance that, that I'm telling you, you got to be careful there because that is combining. Uh, that's a lot of work and something is going to get the ball is going to be dropped someplace for sure. But anyway, yeah. I yeah. think this is pretty interesting and just more along the lines of Secure Act, if nothing else. Yeah. Uh, and, and so this is I think the big one of the big takeaways is to look at the Secure Act and make yes. see what happens with that, because this will create this. Um, opportunity if you will to put a lot more money away and um you know the article is not long it just ends right here so yeah. uh, no we'll put it in the show notes um uh, my man harry from texas says he falls in that category highly compensated but locked out of after-tax contributions because it's top heavy yeah and that's where i'm wondering why the state and i don't want to get too deep again i keep saying that but i now i get deep into it it's the nature of my uh my <laughs> my uh my brain functioning tomorrow but you got things called safe safe harbors and when i was doing 401k plans you have a safe harbor which protected the highly compensated uh from uh from being able to put more in because all the other employees are guaranteed a three percent match is um, so i'm not sure why this guy doesn't reference that yeah. um all right, so Fred says, uh, great topic. Uh, by the way, go Ravens. Uh, so Fred <laughs> is going to be banned from the channel, freaking Ravens. You like football at all, Mar? Well, I used to. I mean, we had San Diego Chargers, and then now they're in <laughs> Los Angeles. You know who uh, else you used to have back there in San Diego? The San uh, Diego Clippers. That might Clippers, be yeah, basketball. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, basketball. Oh, yeah, I mean. Before your time. Yeah, uh, no, I, I have a Clippers, uh, you know, jersey or whatever but oh, yeah, uh, no, that's cool you should that's a all right we got yeah. uh now they're a totally different team so yeah because uh, they yeah. went to la yeah all right so let's see uh we got uh another person uh, speaking of realtors uh mary is uh interested in insurance a long-term care writer we'll take a gander at that uh, here today uh mary for sure uh I'm just reading some comments real quick, Amar, then we'll get this uh, article that Starling uh, sent to us, if that's okay. Yeah, so I'm going to just close it, or yeah. just, just wait. Yeah. Uh, Denise, can I move mutual fund into a non-deductible IRA and then move to a Roth if it actually happens? I guess she's talking about Secure Act. So Denise says, 
uh, from your uh, neck of the woods, Amar, can I move mutual funds into a not, I'm assuming she's saying mutual funds in a taxable account. Yeah. So no, you, so contributions to an IRA, Roth IRA have to be cash comp, okay. uh, contributions. You, can, you can't transfer in-kind securities into a, a plan. Yep. Good. Um, and then Mush, Mushki says she's so confused. Um, it is confusing. I mean, there's no other way around that. It's confusing as all get out. Uh, and that's why at the, unless you're falling into a specific category, it's, it's a tough one. This is why these things are so tough to just paint with a broad brush, uh, brush, brush, broad brush. Should I just do this? I, I, I don't know. I mean, cause we don't know your taxes. We don't know any, I, that's, that's a tough one for sure. Yeah. Especially when we're reviewing articles, it's going to be extremely tough because yeah. you have to take your personal circumstances in, into account with with all of this so when you're looking whether you should do a strategy or not it really depends on your cash flows in retirement and working backwards to see exactly. what you need to do exactly. to, to reach yeah. your goal so and, and, key, and also how long you're going to let live i mean at the end of the day the longer you live the more beneficial tax-free is but you know i mean if you're smoking a carton of cools a day and you're you know driving a motorcycle without a helmet on at 150 miles an hour and uh, you're skydiving without a parachute and uh you're probably not going around for that long um yeah. just real quick uh my man mark says uh mm -hmm. my links on my website are not working okay so i gotta get that looked at that's weird my the links on my website are not working so i appreciate that mark i will look at that uh do you all right so jennifer hamilton says amar uh do you still have to have the roth account five years if you roll over after tax 401k contributions before you can withdraw. Yes. Yes. So the five-year rule is still there. Um, and, you know, one of the things most people, if you don't already have a Roth IRA is, uh, is timing it so that you, you, you exceed that five-year rule. So that is an important piece to mention. Yeah. I, now, if I may just on that, the five-year rule is a, it fo focuses on once you're over 59 and a half, the earnings. I always remember that. I just yeah, look at like earnings. an IRA. Yeah. You know, if you're over 59 and a half, do you have access to your IRA without penalty? Well, the answer yeah. is yes. Do you have access to your IRA without tax? The answer is no. And if you kind of look at it like that with a Roth, is you have access to your principal without penalty, without uh uh, after you did the conversion, but you don't have access to the gains. And it inherently makes yeah. sense because you've already paid taxes on the, the principal, if that makes sense. It's the yeah. gain. So it's, it's only the gains that are attributable to the five-year rule is, is another way of saying it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that was much easier. Um, <laughs> uh, so Mushki again says, I'm 59 and she puts 25K into her company's 401K, but it doesn't match. Then I put 7,000 into my own Roth IRA how does that apply to me? Yeah, um, so, so that's a good question. So, right. So she's putting 25. So mm -hmm. she's uh, getting the 62 is right. her max because she's over 50, right? So if you do 62 minus 25, uh, that's like uh, 75, 3,750. 3, is that, did I did that? 37,500? Yeah. Did I do that math right? Yeah. Something like that. Well, it's just like 35 for simplicity, but yeah. Yeah. So that you, you can put in the after tax if you have that as an option. Now, the, again, so the thing that, that we look at from a tax perspective, and Josh and I are not CPAs or tax planners, but in retirement, you have your pension, social security, uh, other streams of income. You have your RMD from your IRAs. But you also have to factor in the interest and dividends that you're getting from your uh, taxable accounts. And so by putting money here, you're, you're reducing future interest and dividends on those after-tax accounts as well. And then if you do the 25 to your Roth 401k mushki, and then you do the 30, whatever you said, 37,000 to your after-tax, and then you can, you know, later on, you move that after-tax into your Roth IRA once you separate from service. That's a lot of Roth IRA money for sure, without question. Yeah. Um, uh, I just saw something. Oh, Amar, uh, real quick. Yeah, that's 44000 going to your Roth, you know, like the, the after-tax or tax-free bucket, whatever you want to call it. 
per what year. What tax strategies should a highly compensated employee follow after maxing out the Roth for uh, the, the 401k and HSA? Uh, this is Chris. He says, uh, Christopher, uh, any thoughts, uh, Amar? So this guy says he got, he's maxing out his retirement plan, his HSA. Any thoughts on other things uh, tax uh, favorable to do? And, I mean, if it's a small company and they can do a defined benefit plan, uh, that could be an option, you know, if it's a family business, right. And you can have that, but if you're part of a larger company, um, you know, I would be looking at uh, cash flow streams in retirement. Like what do you actually need? So some of that conversation would be starting to pay some more taxes. You know, I know the question was, how do you reduce your taxes, yeah, but you should no. look at your tax picture overall yeah. over a period of time. Exactly. And more. you may need to say like, Hey, um, uh, you know, depending on your spending and retirement, et cetera. I mean, these, these questions uh, are very difficult without understanding more of somebody's background. Um, I would, uh, I, I could 100%. I, and I think, Amar, a lot of people get caught up in, uh, in, in the idea of I got to reduce taxes today without looking at the big picture of the future. Sometimes it just pays to bite the bullet today in order to avoid a bigger one in the future, for sure. So you just got to look at the big picture. And, and some of the things, like if it's a highly compensated employee, they may have access to insurance benefits through their work that are portable. So, for example, like long-term care insurance that is portable. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, it may not be just strictly from an investment standpoint. One of the things, um, if you're charitably inclined, uh, maybe looking at a donor advice fund. So let's say you have five years left till retirement. And, you know, you, you give to a church or whatever, some nonprofit, and you want to continuously do that throughout your retirement as well. Well, during your working years, it may make sense to dump two or three years worth of gifting into a donor advice fund yeah. to get the deduction now, yeah. because in retirement, you know, you may not be, not you know, get expenses could, you, right. there could be some arbitrage based off your expenses in retirement versus well, you're uh, probably not going to have the uh yeah you're not gonna be able to atomize you know what i'm saying because yeah have yeah exactly so you could be in the standard deduction i mean right. i mean so there's that's another we got to talk about donor advised funds you had mentioned that before mar and i and uh we'll definitely i'm a huge fan of das donor advised funds and they're they're a poor man's private foundation we and i i was i don't even say poor man I, I even have people that have a significant wealth oh, i know i'm just saying you don't need a you don't need to be the ford foundation and you know yeah. drink tea with your finger up like that go ooh, you're just, <laughs> you're drinking some budweiser or something like that and fishing off the coast of north carolina like my man jeff here and uh but i mean it's a poor man's trust or foundation that you don't need to be poor yeah, and, and I think it works well p for people that are on the border of standard yeah. deduction and itemizing, yes, exactly. right? And they still have other things that they can do. So one of the strategies, and, you know, again, talk to your CPA and all, all the other things, is that when the years that you are going to itemize is to upfront fund these donor advised funds and, and get a bigger deduction those years and then switch over to standard deduction the following years. Yeah, no, um, and, and then you can do it back and forth, and you know. So, you know, I have, I think I have one of my clients that we itemize one year, and two years do standard deductions, and then itemize again, and then two years standard deductions. So, I mean, you can get as creative as you want with, with that side. But it means you got to be actively doing your taxes, and that's the problem. Oh, yeah. that yeah. A lot of tax folks is that they're reactionary, not uh, pro. Uh, re what's the other word? Uh, uh, Proactive. Proactive. And, yeah. So, uh, so like the, the thing with all, uh, yeah. And maybe this is like a plug or whatever you want to call it. But like when you look at from a, a tax perspective, your CPA is looking backwards. Like what yes. can you do for 2019? Right. Unless you're meeting with them today. Right. Like if you're taking a proactive approach before the year end, um, you know, that would be, I would say is a good tax professional. Your estate planner is working with you whenever they want, you know, once every three to five years to update documents or, or whatnot. Uh, but strategies change and, and your actual value of securities change. You know, like one of the things we exactly. can talk about, talk about is a qualified personal residence trust, or, or, or even if you have a small business and you give shares into a, a, an annuity trust and grantor retained annuity trust, 
and the business goes up, well, the estate planning work, but what if your business value goes down, right? Is there a way that you can substitute or redo that? And so like your attorneys are not taking an active valuation of where your company values are, where your real estate values are or, or securities. So in my opinion, working with an advisor, and I know this is loaded because I'm an advisor, right? But <laughs> uh, being pro, I would say even as an individual being proactive, um, that's the only way you're going to be able to take advantage of all these things is to be on a proactive basis. I mean, I, I uh, could not agree more uh, without question. And uh, however you do it, uh, my friends, it's, uh, um, let's see, Amar, uh, you can exit that if you want. Um, we yep. got a couple. So we're going to this market watch article. Well, let me just uh, hold on just a second. Uh, we got, I saw uh, Rob, uh, my man, the Bruins fan. He says his daughter is a dental hygienist and uh, she makes good money for a two-year education. Could not agree more, man. That's uh, uh, some of my best clients are dental hygienists. That's for sure. Uh, uh, Jennifer said she has the same question as uh, she's maxed out her 401k. What, <laughs> what, what can she do uh, to avoid uh, taxes? I just want to kind of real quick talk on that too. If um. The one thing we don't want you to do, if you maxed out your four, everyone, they, they default to deferred income. And, uh, and I don't do that so much. I think it's okay to pay a little bit more tax today as income and uh, to qualify for qualified dividends and then long-term capital gains. And so what I say to people, like, look, man, and I'm, I'm going to show you my little chart here. Um, oh, it's going to be hard. You want me to stop sharing my screen? Yeah, for just a second, Amar. We got, so we got three things here uh three circles so we have tax deferred tax free or tax deferred, tax free and taxable all right so what that means is tax taxable is like a mutual fund you know your bank account your brokerage account tax deferred is your 401k 403b and tax free is your life insurance and your Roth. and the issue here is everyone most people have most of their money in the tax deferred account and, and we don't, I don't think that's good. In fact, I know it's not good. We want more money in these guys. Um, the reason for that is because if you have money in a taxable a brokerage account, and let's just say it doesn't pay much in terms of dividends or long-term capital gains because it's an ETFs that are not heavily traded and maybe growth oriented ETFs, essentially that sucker is tax-free because the, the, the minimal amount of income it pays may or may not be under your standard deduction, but it could still be taxed much more favorably than money coming out of a tax deferred account, which comes out as OI. And so what right. I tell people is like, look, so I'm going back to Jennifer, you maxed out your 401k and you're like, what else do I do now? And like uh, Chris said, he maxed out his HSA. Well, put in like a Vanguard small cap growth fund, uh, the ETF, where it doesn't have a lot of turnover, so there won't be long-term capital gains. And this is me talking, by the way. It's not a mar. Just want any compliance guys out there. Yeah. Me. Not a recommendation. <laughs> no, but just something that's, that's growth-oriented with minimal dividends and minimal turnover, i.e. capital gains. That way, you're not going to get much, if any, of it. what's called 1099. And I just think people don't do that all the time. They say, I'm going to now I'm going to do a traditional IRA and I'm going to do a variable annuity. I'm like, ah, stop, stop. Pay a little bit more tax today to avoid the huge tax consequence in the future. You, anything you want to add to that, Amar? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two things I would add to that. Like, so if you bring up your diagram, right, the three circles... Like, yeah. Right where you drew them, they're all proportional to each other. Yes. And right. and the when you said that most people have in their 401k, I mean, ratio wise, they shouldn't be exactly equal either. Kind of right? like that Plus, ratio wise. Yeah. So, kind of so like Charlie we, Brown's face. <laughs> Doesn't that look like Charlie Brown? And so like we, we want to have um, some diversification. And if we just look at it from a tax perspective, let's say that you're a married individual and you need a hundred thousand a year to live off of if you're taking all that or let's say you need ten thousand a month so 120 which is high and so i'm just giving you a, yeah. an example and you know you have thirty thousand from social security so let's just say a hundred thousand you have to take out from your 401k that's you're roughly in the 24 percent tax bracket so you're gonna have to actually have to withdraw 124 125 thousand to get that hundred thousand in lifestyle right and so if we take 50,000 from a 401k and 50,000 from a Roth IRA, 
Roth IRA is not taxable. The 401k, 50,000, you know, you maybe you take out tw- uh, 63, 64, somewhere in there. So, uh, I mean, you can save like about nine or 10,000 in taxes per year and still get the same lifestyle, right? 100,000, 100,000 right. from investments. And you multiply that years in retirement. So like if you're, we're thinking about saving taxes now over the next like four to seven years prior to retirement. But if you look while you're in retirement, you know, that could be 20, 30, you know, for some people, 40 plus years. Um, okay. Hold on just a second. The NFL is going to move the chargers to uh, London <laughs> for that too. Yeah. I get- well, in San Diego, uh, there is British Airways nonstop, so that's the only saving grace. Which is safer, Amar? My man from Mass uh, says, which is safer, consumer staples or consumer discretionary ETF? You want to take a shot at that? I, I don't know how you say which is safer or not, but if you have some knowledge yeah. that uh, you want to shine on that. I don't know what the de- – yeah, and it depends on your definition of safer, yeah. right? I mean, because, like, one could have more volatility but theoretically be safer. Like, so one of the things that – most analysts on their calls are looking at is, is inventory, the cost of inventory, right? So if we do go into a recessionary environment, you have to store all these uh, products and stuff like that. So uh, consumer staples seems to have taken on more inventory, number one, and it has taken on more uh, debt. So like we see these buybacks of stocks, right? So it's financing with debt. If you have your debt levels go up, that means your debt to income ratios yeah. are going to go uh, a little screwy. And if you have an environment where your income goes down, um, that would put a lot of pressure. And so I would look at, you know, debt to income ratios between the two, right. And then how much inventory and, and then make a kind of path that way. Unfortunately on these videos, I can't give recommendations no. because I'm a, I'm a registered investment advisor, meaning that, uh, you know, I can't, I can only do educational right. based stuff. I can't. Yeah, there's nothing, stuff. but even that, I mean, I, yeah. you know, what's safe is, I mean, it's, it's only safe until it's not anymore. Right. That's so, I don't know. I just, at the end of the day, you got something that, that looks, I remember Amar back in 2005, uh, floating rate bond funds. And I had a guy from Hartford, nice guy. And I liked him uh, come to my office and floating rate bond funds. I've never had a down year. And they've been around for 15 years and they've averaged, you know, in between stocks and bonds. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. And then yeah. floating rate bond funds proceeded to get destroyed in the chaos of 2007 and eight. And I just, yeah, so, I, so, so, so it's kind of funny you bring that up because in 2008, there was a liquidity crisis, yes, right? Yes. Like commercial paper was defaulting, which has never happened. Yes. Money market accounts would break down block. by two yeah. cents, right? Like, um, some companies had to shore those up, right? They would step in the brokerage yeah. houses, right? Uh, and we look at today, what is the Fed doing? It's creating short-term liquidity again, right? So um, I know we're not doing quantitative easing, but, you know, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> we're printing like, you know, 60 billion plus uh, a month here. So I mean, the Fed's an active Fed. And if yeah. uh, the funny thing is the active Fed, we have a history of the Fed being active and it actually does not end up resulting in recessions and the answer is of course not and so but look at the other day I mean, this is what i say to people all the time or i say look there is there is no there's always a recession coming always you can never get around that it's the business cycle the only way not to have a recession is to go completely uh socialist and then we're always in a recession so it's, it's forever looming forever imminent and of course uh you know given that we're going to a political year it's going to be even more thought out so it's, it's just yeah. us um Let, let's hop into this market yes. watch article yeah, uh, because yep. we're going to be at, at close to an hour here pretty shortly so um so this market watch article was sent by starling right yep. Yep. yeah and it says are you on track and it says the cost of retirement it goes through, uh, you know, the the rate of growth in, in some of these cities, and then uh, I guess there's a link to this uh, how they created this map to see how much, which is over here. Can you see that? All right. Yeah, yeah. make all it right. bigger if you can. Yeah, just uh, the control plus sign. Well, that makes the that zooms it in, but oh, good. There you go. That's good. 
doesn't make my screen full screen. So I was trying to get rid of all this oh, stuff up here. I see you got some up there. Trump's GOPD. So I see you got a uh, YouTube video of something that Trump's <laughs> talking about. Yeah. Um, I also got an Iron Man link there too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, anyway, if you look real quick, Amar, so let's just it's hard to see the pink, but let's look at Arizona. They say you need a million dollars to retire comfortably in Arizona. Uh, they say you need 661,000 to retire comfortably in Mississippi. And I say this is freaking stupid. It's the idea that you need. And it, but I mean, look, it's, it's graphic, it's easy to see, it scares people. It's a perfect clickbait. And here we are clicking it. And uh, because it's, uh, the, the idea that you need 1.1 million in my state of Maine to retire comfortably is absurd. No one in Maine has 1.1 million. When I say no one, I'm being facetious. There are a few people who do. The vast majority of that freaking state doesn't have a million bucks that, that within freaking 20 uh, uh, miles of them. That's for sure, because Maine's a very poor state. And you so the idea that the million point two people there, they're all not going to retire comfortably. It's just that the whole thing, it just infuriates me because they're saying right here that you need this 661,000 in Mississippi. You need to retire comfortably. I just think how absurd that is. Amar. In Mississippi, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You don't, uh, I just, it's just more chatter uh, to get, uh, it's just clickbait is all it is. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what I felt when I read this article was essentially like, they don't understand like whoever put this together is basing off certain fixed expenses for a certain period of time. And like they're, they're putting a basket of fixed expenses and they're trying to get these numbers. Yeah, the reality right. is that we know that, I mean, the travel cost is not included in this, right? Uh, what if you need long-term care? Um, you know, as you grow older, you may need help, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what if you travel? What if you're doing gifting to your children? I mean, none of that type of stuff is included in here. So I wouldn't really give much credence to this because I definitely know there are people that have less than 1.5 million yeah. that are retiring in California. And I definitely know that there are people that have more than, you know, uh, 738,000 in Kentucky that are retiring, right? Like, so it, and, it depends okay. on your lifestyle. I think you managing expenses has a bigger influence than like a chart like this. That's been, that's Amar, that's number one thing. You cannot do a retirement plan until you know expenses. And the issue is how do you know them? And this will go into, I do want to talk a little bit because I had a couple people asked about long-term care. Um, how do you know expenses? You can close out this so we can go back to mm -hmm. full screen if you want. Um, well, you don't, you don't know what your expenses are going to be because you have never retired. And I stress this enough, it's like you are going on some guesstimates, but we know, for example, I will not be in this house right here when I retire. So for me to say I'm going to base a retirement plan on how much it costs to maintain this home is friggin' stupid because this is a, a home for a family of six and seven with my new son back there, Pablo. And we're not going to have this house when my kids are out. We're going to have it's going to be Charlotte and me in a three and two someplace. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? And it's just not going to be the same thing. So how do I project that? Well, I use the best evidence available, which, you know, a $250,000 you know, home, $200,000. I don't know what it'd be. Uh, you know, sell this sucker, hopefully with, you know, get enough cash to buy that new home. And immediately I've reduced my mortgage. I don't have any mortgage and my property taxes declined. And, and, but, you know, so what would my utility bill? I, I think I spent, I got my uh, electric bill right here. And in the month of uh, July, uh, I had 2,358 kilowatt hours use of electricity. Uh, we don't water the grass all that much. So the water bill is, say, 50 bucks a month. Will those be the same? Probably not because we have an acre. Yeah, we probably have, I think, 5,000 square feet. We have about 1.1 acres here, but about 5,000 square feet of, uh, of grass. We're not going to have that when I retire. So that's the whole thing. It's like you just kind of think this through. Now, if you're already living in the place you're going to retire to, well, you have a pretty good gauge of what it's going to cost. But if you're going to move or you're going to downsize, well, you got to tack in that consideration for sure. Did your dad, did they stay in your in their house when the, when they retired or did they downsize them are? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they stayed in the same house. Um, and in fact, my mom lives in the same house. So, okay. uh I think that, you know, this is a good, maybe another conversation point is if, if a spouse passes away, what do we see as advisors actually happen, right? Because you know, some people say, oh, we're going to stay in the same house. 
they end up redecorating the house uh, because the house reminds them of uh, yeah. their spouse. And then uh, a couple of years later, they say, oh, I'm going to move to be closer to the children, right? So those are you know, potentially some added costs that, that we're not planned for. Um, you know, houses is, is difficult because like you were saying, a three bedroom, two bath. I mean, if you're finding a three bedroom and two bath in San Diego, the price could drastically vary um, just within five miles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, well, that's why you got to get it. I mean, you have to have some kind of pre idea of where you're going to be. You see what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, because housing is a big expense. And if yeah. you can find some way to reduce your housing, somehow uh, you'll be better off. Um, my man, <laughs> this is funny. My man, Rob, says the electric bill was cut in half when his daughters moved out. I, I think <laughs> and it's true. I mean, you think about it. The amount of, of draw from a uh, the hair dryer, uh, anything that uh, heats and is plugged into a freaking outlet, an American outlet, AC, is always going to be a significant draw on your electric bill. So as my wife and my two daughters, I'm like, can you just go outside and do that with the natural sun and air? Um, of course, no. The answer you're is gonna no. get yourself in trouble. And that's, that's what I'm happen. saying, right? right? <laughs> My wife isn't watching this. I said, "Do you really need to do that for an hour?" Oh yeah, yeah. But anyway, I just I thought it's funny that uh, yeah. the electric. Yeah, so like the big draws would be a refrigerator. It's probably yeah. more efficient these days. Nah, uh, fridge not much would draw. Is anything that has a heating element? Uh, yeah. Oven. Yeah, so it's all heating because like even TVs now have LED lighting exactly. and stuff like that. So they're low energy. Uh, I, um, I mean, even like a. Uh, your fridge, your TV, I mean, how you can run your, your fridge is probably uh, running at 700 watts, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And when the compressor kicks on, it's probably 1100. You, you, that doesn't, that's not a big draw. It's, it's, it's the, uh, it's the things like your non led lights that people put outside their front, you know, by the garage and stuff like that. Nah. If those things, if those add up, if they're, if they're regular incandescent tomorrow, I, I, you know, I did, I've done a number of videos and posts on this where I say 50 bucks a month, just turning out my non, my incandescent light bulbs that I have above my garage and inside and outside my house with LEDs because there's so much of a draw. Um, all right, so let's talk real quick, and we'll next week we'll dive into it more. But I just on long term care using a life insurance. So back in the day, there's something called Lincoln Money Guard, and I love Lincoln Money Guard. Are you familiar with that by chance, Mar? Have you yeah, ever heard of the, the annuity with the rider? It was a, a life insurance contract. Right. So what it was is you'd basically is essentially a pre a paid up whole life. You say, okay, Lincoln, I'm going to give you fifty thousand bucks at my death. I'll either have, I think it's like $212,000 of death benefit that transfers to my heirs. I'll always have access to that 50,000 bucks. I won't have any access to growth, but I'll always have access to that, you know, where if I later on down the road, I need it. But I'll also have, it was, I can't remember the amount, but it was back, this like, hell, this is going on 15 years ago now. Damn, I'm getting old, man. 15 <laughs> years ago, 2005. Yeah. Um, they got like a, uh, like 97 is like two times essentially the initial cash value amount. So let's just say a hundred thousand bucks. So they got a hundred thousand dollars of long-term care benefit, essentially accelerated death benefit. And they just dumped in 50,000 bucks. So they know they're going to get their money back by dying. They, you know, their spouse will get, you know, two and a half times their, their whatever it was. They knew they were going to get at least some portion of the money back by a tax-free uh, long-term care component. Or they're, if they, you know, later on they hated the company or they needed the cash to have access to it. I, I was, I was a big fan of that and they have it, but those products are coming, they're even better now. And I haven't priced them or anything, but uh, I, I'm a fan because long-term care, you know, I have long-term care, my wife and I do. And, uh, you know, every year I get this, I think it's a guaranteed payout option, which is if I want to increase my long-term care benefit. I have to increase my premium with a rate of inflation. And uh, every year that sucker just goes up and up and up. Now I got it when 10 years ago. So it was a lot cheaper when I was 39 than it would be now, but you know, those are expensive products. And yeah, they, I was just going to ask you, like, have, had they done a rate increase in the last five oh, years? They, every, well, it's, all, it's flexible. You don't have to pay the rate increase. Uh, that's yeah. a GPO. I think it's GPO. They say, if you want to keep up with the cost of what they anticipate as long-term care, you just have to pay a higher premium and then it won't be compounded with inflation like it used to be in the old days is you can buy the compounding if you want. Yeah. The cola. 
Uh, cool. Exactly. Which yeah. is fine. You can buy it or not, but I'm telling you that's expensive. And, and so the issue there is you're paying and paying and paying for a product that you're not likely to use. And that's why I like the life insurance component because it says you have access, you're going to get your money back or you'll get it through an insurance policy. Uh, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, long-term care, I think I read a statistic uh, a while back that one out of every three people who are 60 or older will use long-term care. Yes, but be careful with that. People hear that and they think it's nursing home. It is not nursing home. Yeah, yeah. Someone's going to provide some level of assistance for you. Yeah. That could be anything. You see it could be anything, right? Um, Such a freaking scam, dude. And, they, and, I, and I look at it this way. If, if, you, if, you, if you live a long life, if you don't die, you you grow older and you tend to need more help. Yes. How are you going to get that help? Inherently. inherently. Long-term care could be part of that solution. It could also be family. It could be also. Well, you know, but, but I got to stop. Long-term care and family are not mutually exclusive. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what they're leading people. It could be to both. Be. Yeah. It is both. And most yeah. of the time, the family is long-term care. Yeah. And so if we take one of every three people above 65 needs some form of long-term care. That allows people to think, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, freaking, you know, an immigrant from Nigeria is going to change my diapers. And that's not not true. It could for me, my wife will take care of me to some regard. And it could be anything. Amar. It's the, yeah. the media has let that on to be. It, it infuriates me man, because it's fake. But, but so so I, I would, let me give an example, maybe kind of. Uh, maybe slightly different in the sense yeah. that um, having a policy heck you've paid for it now right? right you've paid for it for so when you when you do need care you're more likely to use it to get oh, yeah. the care right so depending on your personality if you're a saver from or your parents were from the depression era and all you've done is learn to save 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 and never spend right. when you need care you're less likely to actually spend to get the care that you need and so from a long-term care insurance policy like we had a partnership policy for my dad yeah. Uh, so somebody came in and said, all right, we need wheelchair access here. Right. We need, right. um, you know, they have two stories. So they needed like one of those elevator lift yeah. chairs. Absolutely. And, and, and Absolutely. some of those things got done. Whereas if, it, if my parents didn't have a policy, uh, you know, we'd probably say, all right, we can use the downstairs bedroom, you know, like you'd improvise or you you'd, right. yeah. uh, figure out a way to make it work. So um, I That's also look at long term care. Because huh? life insurance component says you get the best of both worlds. If you don't need the long-term care, you'll have it as a death benefit. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But you got to be careful because it is expensive, right? Like, because they're taking two care. benefits yeah. and they're putting into one. Yeah, that's right. And they're trying to use the probabilities that you're going you're gonna to use one of them. So they have to cover their cost, right? So, so it they're is they're expensive. They're not stupid. They know yeah. they're covering two risks and both risks are competing. The yeah. longer you live, the more likely, like you said, you need long-term care. Exactly. The less you live, well, inherently, the more likely they're going to have a life insurance payout. So yeah. inherently, yeah. there's going to be two. It's going to be more expensive yeah. on either. I 100% agree. Yeah. But that's a nice thing if you got, you know, just say you got some. I hate to say dead asset because you know there is no such thing as a dead asset. But if you got an account that's, you know, just sitting there floundering in a one percent money market. You're like, I don't know. Well, buy if you can, if you can get underwritten, you know, buy a long term care or a life insurance policy. Maybe I'm not, you know, I don't know your certain, not you, Mar, but whoever's watching the circumstance. But you buy, you look at a life insurance with a long term care policy, you spend 50,000 bucks, and at least you got that asset covered. I, I think it's actually not a bad move because going back to what you said earlier, too, Amar, if you're in a 24% tax bracket and you're going to self finance your long term care. Well, if you have everything bulking in an IRA, it takes one twenty four to pay for hundred thousand dollars long term care. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you got to pull the money out; it's taxable. And I think well, yeah, and, and I look at also like uh, stress on the portfolio, right? Yes. So if, if we're like think retirement is planning is kind of like a bell curve shape, yeah. right? Like if you as you get closer to making retirement reality, um, expenses can sway it one way or another really quick, and so. If you have long-term care expense, let's say a married couple, one spouse needs long-term care, you still have the other spouse that has normal expenses. Yeah. Right? And then if there's a big drawdown um, and then you don't need uh, care, uh, how does a surviving spouse uh, 
make ends meet because the portfolio would be drastically less. My man says, Amar, my man says, Quincy, I don't think I'm going for, I don't think Josh is going to Virginia now because the Democrats now control the whole state. You're right. Quincy, you read my mind. I thought that myself this morning. I don't know if you saw the election returns yesterday, but the Democrats took over and, and, uh, and so I said, I guess I got to write Virginia off my retirement destinations <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, uh, Denise loves, loves, uh, she said traffic sucks in your neck of the woods tomorrow, but she goes, once she retires, she can work around that. Uh, my yeah. man Rob says, uh, Massachusetts is, is, uh, is, is reasonable. Good, good flights there. Just the real estate taxes are high and, uh, that's all good, man. Um, yeah, right on. That's what Quincy said. You're gonna be a. You're gonna be a California Mar. Uh, you're gonna stay there until uh until you're forever. <laughs> Man, I mean, you talk about the weather. You you really ought to see San Diego weather. It's uh you get it's like Groundhog's Day. You know. Yeah, I don't like that. I like the Four Seasons, brother. Yeah, see, that's like my wife. My wife's from Baltimore. Yeah. My wife likes like. Uh, but so so the beauty about living in Southern California, you're an hour away from the desert hour away from the mountains well, i get all that but it's not right there i walked yeah. out this morning it was freezing my tush off when i took old pablo out for first of his like thousand walks today now i'm in shorts you know what i'm saying and when i come yeah. back later on this evening i'll be back in you know a hoodie and whatnot with a beautiful beautiful uh full you don't have foliage because you don't have any trees out there i mean you're no, still no no so i need yeah, a tree man. yeah we drive about maybe 30 to i would say an hour outside of san diego to see the the colors yeah yeah, you're a West Coast. You're a laid back guy. I'm too intense. I'm an East Coast guy. Yeah. So you wait <laughs> folks on the West Coast like, man, Josh, relax, dude. I'm like, no, I got it. I'm too, I'm too hyper. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, here's Jennifer from Washington State says four seasons there. I think they got two, right? They got gray for nine months and sunny for three, I think. Um, so let's do this, Amar. We'll hang this up. We've had, a, I think we had at one point about 65 people on. So that's good. So as we start these videos and do them on a regular basis, more and more people show up, which is good. And it's fun. It's fun to do and get comments. Um, what you can do is, and I'll, I'll share this with you offline, but you can actually look at the comments too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to play my disclosure oh, for please. compliance yeah, yeah. purposes. Yep. So uh, just bear with me here. Yep. All right. And here, I'm going to hit play. Let me know if you can hear it. All right. Click the subscribe button below oh. to be notified when new episodes become available. The opinions expressed in this program are for yeah, general here. informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. Any indices referenced for comparison are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. Uh, Client First Capital LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Client First Capital LLC and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Client First Capital LLC unless a client service agreement is in place. Cool. Thank you. Is that, is that your wife? Is she reading that? No, it's uh, like a voiceover thing. Okay. Um, Say, so, because your wife sounds very professional. That was her. Um, <laughs> before we hang up, guys, just uh, I got a uh, an email from a man who's uh, from who's Indian. You know, not American Indian, but Indian, and uh, he just went back because uh, he had to go take care of his uh, family back there. Uh, and just I want to share a story real quick. It take two seconds, but don't put off happiness uh, if you can enjoy today. Because uh, my man here, uh, he's he by the grace of God did he survive? He had some a young man, he's an MD, a young guy, Amar. Like 35 years old, he came down with some serious, uh, what he thought was life threatening. And long story short, he ended up meeting his wife and having a kid. The whole thing is just a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, but now he's, you know, taking care of his own parents out in India. And, uh, you know, it's just, I, I sit there and I do struggle a lot with people, um, young folks in particular, who are, who are just getting depressed. Uh, and we see that with white guys in particular, there's more white guys killing themselves now than there's ever been. And I just, it boggles me because we're sitting here in this mass amount of abundance 
and I, but it's not about the abundance. It's just about having the ability to have a, a, a reason to exist. And, uh, and my man here, his, you know, obviously has a reason to exist with his wife and kids that he never thought he would have and, and helping his parents out. But, you know, I, I just, I wish I've, I've never been, I've never had depression or anything like that tomorrow. I, tomorrow, I don't know what that's like, but I, I, I hope that if there's anyone watching, uh, who's having that kind of thought that they don't matter that they do because uh, here's a guy. I mean, it was, it was, he thought he had like a couple weeks to live, you know what I'm saying tomorrow. And, and I'm sh and I don't know what thought process passed through his mind about, uh, you know, taking himself out or anything like that. But if he would have done that, he would not have his wife and would not have his children to show for it. And I just, uh, we can, I, I, the reason I want to go on this diatribe is because I think we focus a lot on the numbers, which is good. Uh, but what's the number serving? What's the point we're serving? You know, we're not serving retirement. Retirement is supposed to serve us. Our investments are supposed to serve us. And unless if we focus it differently that I need to do this to serve my money, to serve my company, to serve my retirement, we're going to overlook the important thing, which is your enjoyment, man. And if your enjoyment is dictated on the amount of freaking net worth you have, that's a problem. Because like my man, another guy just said, uh, Don, or Dan, he says, you can retire on Social Security. If that's all you got and you can be happy with your Social Security income, freaking more power to you. More power yeah, to you. So, so, and that's really good to say because we want to focus on values. Like, yes. what do you value? If you value traveling and we look at your budget and you're spending, you know, $1,000 a month eating out. Yes. Yeah. Your, your decision-making, your behavior is misaligned. And, yeah. and really what we should be doing is aligning our values with our goals and our goals with our behaviors, right? And so from there, we want to make sure that we, we've identified your values, making sure that we're how our spending habits are or fin financial decision-making is aligned with what we value. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. If you all have audience, any uh, tagline that Amar and I should use, we're thinking about, we haven't really thought of that much, but I mean, some kind of, you know, these, some of these guys have, uh, what do you say, wealthaholics or something like that. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it'd be fun to have a little tagline that we could say, you're tuned into the Amar and Josh, you know, freaking fight club, or I don't know what it is. <laughs> if you have anything you can think of that'd be kind of catchy, uh, just remember every Wednesday at noon, we'll be doing this. So uh, put it on your calendar. Send some questions in advance, certainly while we're doing this. Uh, and then uh, we'll just keep doing this going forward until, uh, until the regulators tell us to shut the hell up. But until then, man, it's, uh, I appreciate you all being here. Like I said, we've had a record for our own turnout so far, Mar, and hopefully that will build. And uh, we'll just see how this shakes out, man. Sounds good. Well, Talk to you. Appreciate you being here, brother. Thanks, man. Yeah. I'm going to end this. Thanks, guys, for being here. All right. We'll see you.